parallax scrolling is when background images move past the camera slower than the foreground, creating an illusion of depth in a 2D space. This is what my game looks without it. And this is what it looks with parallax. Which one do you prefer? Today, we are learning about vanilla JavaScript game development for beginners, and by the end of this video, you will have deep understanding about endlessly scrolling backgrounds and how to add parallax effect to your games and websites. When we have full control of individual layers, we can match scroll speed to different actions our game character takes. For example, my dog character can sit down and the game stops moving, or it can do this rolling attack and the game speeds up. Art assets for this episode were created by this amazing artist. Check out their website for more if you want. What is the easiest way to create endlessly scrolling backgrounds? How to make different layers move at different speeds to create parallax effect? How to make scroll speed dynamic so we can easily change it? We will learn all of that and more. Let's bring our coding skills one step further today together and have some fun with plain vanilla JavaScript. This tutorial is for beginners. Let's go. Click like please. By the way, there is this amazing class called Demystifying Parallax by Rich Armstrong. I was really surprised by quality of this and how well explained all of the concepts were. If you want, you can check it out. I will leave a link to this and my other favorite tutorials in the video description. I create a basic web page markup. In document head, I use link tag to include my style CSS file. We will use it to position canvas. At the bottom of document body, I place my script tag. Script.js file will contain all functionality and logic for our project. I also create HTML canvas element with an ID of canvas1. It will be our main project area and we will draw on it with JavaScript. In style CSS, I take body tag and I set its background to black. Canvas will be set to position absolute border 3 pixels solid white, width of 800 pixels, height 700 pixels, I do transform translate minus 50% for x axis and minus 50% for y axis and then I offset top by 50% and left by 50%. This will center my canvas in the middle of the page both vertically and horizontally. In script.js, I create a custom variable called canvas and I point it towards my HTML canvas element by ID canvas1. CTX, shortcut for context, will take this canvas variable from line 1 and it will call getContext built in method on it. GetContext can only be called on a variable that holds a reference to canvas element and when I pass it argument that says 2D, it will create an instance of built-in Canvas 2D API object that contains all properties and drawing methods we will need today. I need to make sure we have the correct scaling, because if you don't set Canvas width and height, it will default to 300 times 150 pixels. I create variable I call Canvas underscore width, all capitals, to make it clear it's a global variable. I set it equal to Canvas from line 1. Dot width which will access width attribute on HTML canvas element we created in index.html and I set all to 800 pixels. The same value we gave canvas width in style CSS. I do the same thing for height. Canvas underscore height is equal to canvas dot height is equal to 700 pixels. This is how you set up most canvas projects. Now we have our drawing board ready and we can focus on building parallax effect. I want the scroll speed to be dynamic, tied to a variable, so that in our game we can speed up or slow down using special moves with our character. To control scrolling speed, I will declare a global variable called game speed and I will initially set it to, for example, 5. Notice I didn't use const keyword here, I used let. Let keyword in JavaScript is used to declare variables that can be reassigned to different values later. I will need this to be able to dynamically change scrolling speed. It's time to bring images to the project. Art for this episode was created by this artist. I really like his art style. You can download them in the video description. You can use these images for learning purposes. For commercial projects, you will have to purchase a full license from his website. 
This effect will also work with any other image, but maybe you first want to use the same files I'm using so that you get the same result and don't have to worry about calculating different width and height or making sure your layers match. Once you fully understand the code from today's lesson, it will be easy to switch the images and adjust values so that the codebase works with your own files. The images are very large. If you experience any lagging or frame drops, making images smaller will significantly improve performance. I kept them large on purpose so that we get nice clean visuals, but especially if you are creating a mobile game, these images can be much smaller. You can download the project files in the video description. Our background will have five layers. It is perfect to demonstrate seamless parallax scrolling for games. This is one of my favorite 2D game artists. If you want, you can go and check out his website. I will leave a link in the video description. He offers some free art assets you can play with and use in your games, but if you want something a bit more special, his prices are very affordable. There aren't many 2D game artists out there, so if you can, help me out to support them and buy some of their assets for your projects. It will help us to make our games unique, and by purchasing from and supporting our artists, they can make more beautiful game assets for us. To bring image into our canvas project is very simple with JavaScript. I create a constant variable called background layer one and I set it equal to new image. This is built in image class constructor. It simply creates an image element. We can use append child built in JavaScript method and it would slot image tag, img tag into our HTML file. Same as if we wrote that tag in index.html ourselves. We can also choose not to append it and it will stay hidden and it will just store the image for us. Image constructor has the same functionality as the document.createElement img. We are simply creating HTML image element and saving it in this variable. At first, that image element is blank, so I access its source property and I set it equal to layer-1.png. For you, the path might be different depending on how you structured your project files and folders. I left my image files in the same folder with my script file for now. We have five layers, five different images, so let's do the same thing for all of them to bring them into the project. Let's create animation loop. I create a custom function called, for example, animate. It will contain all the code I need to draw my backgrounds. I will be calling it over and over to create animation. Let's start by calling ctx.drawImage built in canvas method. This method will take image and it will draw it on canvas. The first argument I pass it is the image I want to draw, so background layer one from line seven. I want to draw it at coordinates zero, zero, so from the top left corner of canvas. Then I call built-in request animation frame function and I pass it animate, the name of its parent function from line 18. This way, animate will run over and over, creating my animation loop. On line 19, I need to call draw image from my CTX variable from line 2. Background layer 1 image is not the best one to use as an example. Let's try layer 2, layer 3, 4, 5. Let's do this at first with layer 4 to see exactly what's going on and then we can throw in all the other layers. It looks like a static image, but it's actually animating over and over. Let me show you. On line 18, I create a variable called x and I set it to zero. On line 21, inside draw image method, I replace hardcoded zero with this x variable and every time animation loop runs, I decrease x by one. This will make our image move to the left in a negative direction on horizontal x axis. The reason the image is being smudged like this is because we can see all previous frames. We can see old paint. If we want to see only the current animation frame, we need to delete old paint. I use built-in clear rectangle method. It expects four arguments to determine what part of canvas I want to delete. I want to clear the entire canvas, so from coordinates 0, 0 to canvas width, canvas height. Now, old paint is being deleted and we can only see the current animation frame. Image is moving to the left by one pixel per frame. On line 5, we declared a game speed variable, so down here on line 23 I can say x minus equals game speed, and now scrolling of our game is attached to this game speed variable. If I do 15, it moves much faster. As you can see, the background just moves endlessly to the left, and eventually it leaves canvas empty. 
These images were specifically crafted for endlessly scrolling games and they are seamless. It means you can stack them next to each other and it will look like it's one repeating image. I need to somehow detect when my image has moved off screen and I need to reset it so it can scroll again. Let's try it. What if I say if x is less than minus 1000 pixels, set it back to zero. Else x minus equals game speed. I increase game speed to 15 here on line 5. You can see the image is resetting, but we can clearly see the jump when the reset happens. Let's try 1600 on line 23. Still it jumps. I know that images we are using today are 2400 pixels wide, so what if I use 2400 pixels here? And I also reset x to 2400. Now we have this image that is 2400 pixels wide, scrolling endlessly over the canvas. And there is this black empty space that is also 2400 pixels wide. The trick people use is to simply draw the same image twice and always reset the one that has moved off screen so that it's available to scroll again and canvas is never empty. I will show you exactly what's going on using two separate x variables, one for each image, and then we will optimize it once we fully understand what's going on. On line 18, I have x variable, which will serve as horizontal position for one of my background images. I will create variable I call for example x2. That's for the position of my second identical image. x will start at position 0. And on lines 24 and 25, I have my reset checks to make sure it cycles around endlessly. X2 will start where the first image ends. Since my images are 2400 pixels wide, X2 will be 2400. Images we are using today are very large. You might experience frame drops and lag in. If you do, you can make them smaller, but maybe if you can, just follow along with me till the end and then refactor your code and image files for performance, just to make sure we are looking at the same numbers at first. It makes it easier for you to debug your code if it's the same as mine. Once you fully understand this technique, you can use it for any image size and any scroll direction your game needs. On line 24, I just call draw image again for the same identical image, but instead of drawing it at position X from line 18, we will draw it at position X2 from line 19, like this. I also need to reset X2 the same way I'm resetting X. This is so-called spaghetti code. <laughs> we have some code repetition here and it doesn't look very clean yet. I'm just doing it for complete clarity to show you what's going on. We will refactor it later. You will notice we have one problem when we do it this way, but don't worry, we will optimize it and fix everything. I want even beginners to understand. Now I can see some frame drops because my images are large, but I only see it on my screen recording software, it still runs smooth in my browser. Don't worry about the frame drops at this stage, it can be easily fixed by making our images smaller. Let's focus on the code first and make sure we understand it. You might notice there is a gap between my images. What's happening now? I have image 1 drawn at position x from line 18 and I have image 2 drawn at position x2 from line 19. The problem with this technique is that my images ignore each other. They reset based on two different variables, x and x2. These variables are completely disconnected, so if width of my image is not divisible by game speed variable, it can actually happen that this gap between images will grow larger or smaller over time, and we really don't want that. We want endlessly scrolling, seamless background. Let's deal with it step by step. So what's this gap between my images? Why is it there, and how do I offset my images to get rid of it? Part of the gap is my game speed, because these if statements that reset x and x2 happen independently of each other. We have situations where x resets and x2 will move 15 pixels to the left for that frame. 15 pixels because that's what my game speed variable is set to on line 5 at the moment. They never reset at the same time because one of them is always visible on canvas. So when x resets, image 1 resets on line 25, or when x2, image 2 resets on line 27, I need to offset the other one by the amount of game speed to account for the fact that for that frame, the other image kept moving while the other one was resetting.
Gap is smaller now, but there is still a gap. Game speed is 15 pixels per frame, and my images reset when their X position is less than minus 2400. So unless 2400, which is my image width, is divisible by the current speed, with no remainder, there will always be some leftover pixels creating a gap. This gap could even grow larger and larger as the scrolling and resetting continues. Some people deal with it by only allowing their game speed to be certain values so that image width is always divisible by game speed without any remainder. But we don't want this limitation, we want our game speed to be fully dynamic. Maybe you want your game to slowly go faster and faster as player progresses to more and more difficult levels. Or maybe you want to have special moves in your game and when player performs these moves, you want them to affect speed of scrolling, like I do with this roll attack, for example. To do this, we just need to make sure that our X and X2 reset statements check position of the other image before they reset, and they offset its new position based on the current position of the other image. That way, even when gap is somehow created, it autocorrects itself next time around, during the next reset. I do it by accounting for the current X2 position in my X reset check on line 25, and I account for current X position in my X2 reset check on line 27. Keep in mind that when these reset checks happen, X or X2 are small numbers somewhere around zero at that point. This might be a bit tricky to visualize, and I know that some of you are already saying, Frank, what are you doing? There is a much simpler way to reset endlessly scrolling backgrounds using just one variable. There is no need for this X2 variable. There is no need for all this offsetting by speed and position of the other image to synchronize them. It can be done with much less code, and it is so simple. And if you already realized that, well done, you are good. Let me know in the comments if you are one of those people. I went through all of this to show you my process and to actually show you how it works. I didn't realize it can be done with one variable until I got to this stage when I was building the initial prototype. Also, I think everything we have done so far is really good for beginners to see what's going on and how this trick is achieved. We will clean this all up and optimize everything. But before we do that, let's animate all layers and make them move at different speeds. Parallax effect is when foreground layer moves faster than the background layer. It creates kind of a 3D effect, illusion of depth in a 2D space. It can be used in games, but it also looks really nice on websites. In our project, we will have five layers, five images, and I want each one to move at a different speed. At the same time, I want all the layers to be tied to the same game speed variable so that when player performs special move, for example, the speed of all five layers is affected proportionately. How do we do that? Let me show you. First, let's check if all five layers are animated correctly. Everything is working, perfect. So how do I animate all of these layers at the same time? I guess I could just copy draw image on lines 23 and 24 and duplicate it for all five layers. Then I would have to create a separate reset checks for their X and X2 positions to make sure they scroll at the different speeds. It's possible to do that, but there would be a lot of code repetition. Let's do it in a clean way. I delete X and X2 variable from line 18 and 19. I also delete all this code between lines 20 and 25. I will use JavaScript classes to create a blueprint for a layer object. Then I create five instances of that layer class, one for each of my five layers. I will put all of them inside an array and I will be cycling through that array to update and draw them. It might sound complicated if you never used the JavaScript classes before, but don't worry, I will explain everything. It's actually quite simple. JavaScript classes are used when you want to create many similar objects. In our case, we will create five image layer objects. JavaScript class is a blueprint, I will define it, and then whenever I call it, it will create one instance of that object, based on my custom blueprint. When I say it creates similar objects, I mean these layer objects will have shared properties and methods, but some of the properties will have different values. They will all have the same width of 2400 pixels. Each layer object will also have image and speed property, but each layer will have different image assigned to it and different speed value. That's what it means when I say similar. Same properties, but maybe different values. Let me show you how simple it is, step by step. We define class by using class keyword, followed by a custom name of that class, starting with a capital letter. I will call my custom class layer, for example. 
each JavaScript class has one mandatory method called constructor. In object-oriented programming, when you say method, all it means is function attached to an object. Method is just a function. So this special mandatory constructor method has only one job. Whenever our class is called later, constructor will trigger itself, it will create one new blank object, and it will assign values and properties to that new blank object based on blueprint inside the constructor. Constructor runs only once per object, every time JavaScript class is called using the new keyword. I will show you in a minute. My constructor will expect two arguments, image we want to assign to that layer and speed modifier, because I want each layer to scroll at slightly different speed. We will pass these arguments from the outside when we create our five layer objects. I will show you in a minute. For now, let's finish our blueprint. The syntax might be a bit strange for you if you are new to object-oriented programming. Each layer object will have horizontal x coordinate that starts at position 0. I say this dot x because my layer class will create many similar objects, so I'm saying here on line 20, set x property on this particular object you are creating right now to 0. Because we are inside blueprint, that will trigger every time we call our class to create an object. I will also have a vertical y coordinate that will be set to 0. All our layers will have the same width of 2400 pixels. Height will be 700 pixels for all my layers. X2 coordinate will be where we draw the second image. The second image needs to start where my first image ends, so at the horizontal position 2400 pixels. I know I said we could do this without X2 property using just one variable. Let me just recreate what we had before as a class and then we optimize it together. I want to do this step by step for clarity. This dot image equals image. This declaration is a bit different. What I'm doing here, I'm telling my constructor, create property called image on this new object you are creating right now and set it to image we pass as argument on line 19. I will show you how to pass arguments to constructor when the class is complete. I will do the same now with this dot speed modifier. It equals the speed modifier passed on line 19 as an argument to my class constructor. This dot speed will be how fast is my image layer moving. I will calculate it by taking my global game speed variables and I multiply it times this dot speed modifier from line 26. Doing this will allow me to pass different speed modifier value for each of my five layers. And that way each layer will move at a different speed, but it will still be tied to my global game speed. You will see in a minute. My layer object will also have access to custom method I call for example update. Its job will be to move layers horizontally by changing their this.x and this.x2 properties from lines 20 and 24, and it will reset them when the layers move off screen, the same way we did it before. We are doing the same thing we had before, but this time we are wrapping it in a reusable class syntax, so that we can do all of this at the same time for all five layers. We will also have a method I call for example draw. Its job will be to take information about this layer object and to draw it on canvas. Every time update method runs to change horizontal x position, draw will run again to redraw the image at the new position. To make sure my game speed is dynamic and always reacting to the current value of my global game speed variable from line 10, I need to recalculate this dot speed like this. If you want your game to have a constant, never changing scrolling speed, you don't need to do this line of code. Now I just say if this.x from line 20 is less or equal to minus this.width from line 22, so minus 2400 pixels, then set this.x to this.width plus offset it by the current position of my x2 minus this.speed. I'm just recreating the same thing we did before. I explained why I'm offsetting it by x2 and speed. It is to make sure there is no gap between my images. I copy this entire code block and I do the same thing for this .x2 property from line 24. So this .x needs to be offset by the current value of x2 and this .x2 needs to be offset by the current value of this .x. If they are not resetting, I just want my x property to decrease 
by the amount of this dot speed from line 27. To make my background layer move to the left, I will wrap it in method floor to make sure we have no decimal points in there. Not sure if this is a good idea, let's see a bit later. Uh, I do the same thing for this dot x2. This can be optimized and simplified and we will do it in a minute. Now I can take these newly updated x and x2 coordinates and I draw two identical images next to each other, like we did before. So draw image built-in canvas method. I pass it this.image from line 25, this.x and this.y, this.width and this.height. Then I draw the same image, but I will draw it at this.x2 horizontal coordinate, like we did before. And that's it. Layer class is complete. We have a blueprint inside the constructor and my layer objects have access to custom update and draw methods. Now I can create a new constant variable I call for example layer4 and I set it equal to new layer like this. The new keyword is a special command in JavaScript. It will look for class with that name in our code and it will trigger its constructor. On line 19 I can see that my layer constructor expects two arguments image and speed modifier. I need to pass them here when I'm creating an instance of my class. So I will pass it background layer 4 variable as image and speed modifier will be maybe 0.5. I want this layer to be moving at half of my game speed. So if my game speed is 10 pixels, this layer will be moving at 5 pixels per frame. Let's test it. So here on line 46, I call my layer class constructor from line 19. It created one new blank object for me and assigned it properties and values I defined in my blueprint between lines 20 and 27. Then it saved that new layer object inside this layer 4 variable. So this is how you create an instance of your custom JavaScript class. As we know, my layer class has access to update method from line 29 and to draw method from line 40. I can just go inside my animation loop I can take layer 4 variable from line 46 and I can call update and draw on it like this. And here we go. We refactored our image layers into JavaScript class and now it's very easy to work with it. I can pass it a different speed modifier on line 46 to make it move at a different speed. That speed is still relative to my global game speed variable from line 5, because I keep track of that on line 30 inside update method. I create variables for all my five layers. I will pass different images to each one. I could just call their update and draw methods by duplicating lines 54 and 55 like this, now I'm drawing layer 4 and layer 5, but there would be a lot of code repetition if I did it for all 5 layers. If I change speed modifier value, I pass the layer class constructor on line 50, you can see their relative speed changes and we have parallax effect. Awesome. It is because that speed modifier takes game speed and adjusts it by multiplying game speed from line 5 times this modifier value. At first it happens on line 27 when the new object is created. Then it happens on line 30 whenever update method runs to make sure we can change global game speed dynamically, which we will do in a minute. Then we are just using this.speed property to recalculate horizontal exposition of our background images here on lines 37 and 38. And this is how you make your layers scroll at different speeds but still tie them together by using global game speed variable. Inside my animation loop I can just call update and draw for all five layer objects, but I don't want any code repetition. I create a new variable I call for example game objects and I set it equal to an array. I put layer 1 variable from line 46 in there, layer 2, 3, 4, 5. Now I have all five layers inside a single array, so on line 56 I take this game objects array and I call built in for each array method. For each method will simply run through all elements in the array and it will apply whatever callback function I give it to each of these elements, each of the layers. First I need to declare how I want to refer to individual objects in game objects array within my for each callback. I will refer to them as object for example. I'm doing ES6 arrow function syntax here, where you can omit function keyword. 
So for each layer object, in my game objects array, I will call their associated update and draw methods like this. Here we go, we are drawing all five layers now, awesome. Let's pass each layer a different speed modifier to create proper parallax effect. 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.8 and 1. Now each layer moves at a different speed, but they are all still relative to our global game speed variable from line 5. If I change global game speed variable, it will affect all five image layers proportionately, because their speed is calculated by multiplying game speed times speed modifier. If you get any frame drops at this point, it is because we are using five images that are 2400 times 700 pixels. You will get much better performance if you make the images smaller in Photoshop or some other graphics editor. As you can see, I can change my game speed to any value and parallax background will still scroll based on that. I want to allow my users to easily change scroll speed. In index.html, I create a div with an ID of container. Inside, I will have paragraph tag that will say game speed, colon, and span element with an ID of show game speed. This will show real time value of game speed variable. I create HTML input element with type properties set to range. Min value will be 0, max value will be 20, starting value will be 5. Class will be slider, for example, and ID slider as well. I put HTML canvas element inside the container. In style CSS, I take container. I give it position absolute with 800 pixels. I center it in the middle of the page using transform translate. I set canvas to position relative so that it aligns with container. I put border on the container so we see where it is. Input with an ID of slider will have width of 100%. Text color white. Okay, that doesn't work. I take paragraph tag and I move text color there. On container, I set font size to 25 pixels and I remove border. In script.js, I create a new constant variable, I call for example slider, and I point JavaScript towards my new slider element with get element by ID. On the first page load, I will set slider value property, which is here, to game speed variable from line 5. Then I take hold of this span element with ID of show game speed and I save it in a variable I call show game speed as well. On the first page load, I set its inner HTML equal to the current value of game speed variable from line 5. If I change value of game speed and reload page, you can see it works. Now I want to change scrolling speed of my layers when I click this slider. To do that, I need to connect it to game speed variable from line 5. On line 22, I take slider from line 18 and I call add event listener. We will listen for change event and in callback function, whenever change event occurs on the slider, which means whenever user clicks on it to change its value, I will run some code. Callback function on event listener has access to its built-in event object. I will refer to it as E here. I can refer to it however I want. JavaScript knows that the first argument passed to callback function on event listener refers to this built-in event object. If I console log this E, you can see it gets console logged every time change event occurs on slider, and it contains a lot of useful information about that event. Right now, I'm interested in its target property, which references target of this change event, which is HTML input element with an ID of slider. When it gives me that, I can access its current value attribute, which is exactly what I need. If I console log e.target.value, it will give me the current value of this slider input element. I set minimum value to 0 and maximum to 20 here. All I have to do now is take game speed variable from line 5 and I set it equal to e.target.value like this. And I will also update inner HTML in show game speed span so that it displays the correct current speed for us. Now I can change scroll speed of my layers by clicking on slider. 
If I change it to max 50, we can get it to scroll really fast. <laughs> I hope your computer can handle that. These images are too large. <laughs> Let's set max value back to 20. You probably already realized earlier that we don't need to have this.x2 property here on line 33, and we can calculate position of both images using just this.x. That way, we don't need to have two separate reset checks here, and since everything is coming from just one variable, we don't need to do all this complicated offsetting we did earlier, because we don't need to make sure x and x2 are synchronized. If you want a little challenge, pause the video right now and try to refactor update method yourself by deleting all references to this.x2 and using only this.x to calculate positions of both images. If you don't know how to do it, don't worry. I also didn't realize it at first until I started working on this tutorial. I comment out line 33. On line 51, inside draw image method, I replace this.x2 with this.x from line 29. I comment out this if statement and also this line 48. I remove reference to this.x2. Since I'm using this.x for both images on line 51 and 52, you can see our parallax has gap again. This time a big gap. <laughs> Lucky for us, it's very simple fix. On line 52, I set horizontal x coordinate to this.x from line 29 plus this.width from line 31. That doesn't quite fix it yet, as you can see. I also have to look at my if statement on line 40. If this.x is less or equal to minus this.width, minus 2400 pixels, set this.x back to zero. If you don't understand what is happening right now, look at this. I have one image drawn at position x, which starts at 0, and the second image is drawn at position x plus width. These images sit next to each other and scroll to the left together, like this. When the first image moves past the left edge of canvas, the second image is there to fill the gap and make it look seamless. When the right edge of the first image hits the left edge of canvas, at the same time, this.x is minus 2400 pixels. Because my image is 2400 pixels wide, we will trigger reset. It will just jump back here and start scrolling again. The first method was controlling x coordinate for these two images separately by using this.x and this.x2 variables. We had to make sure it synchronizes correctly. Both images were moving independently and I was offsetting them by their scroll speed and by the current horizontal position of the other image to make sure they stayed aligned. This is just a visual representation of what was happening. Of course, the transition itself, where the image resets after leaving the screen, was happening instantly. More like this. This second improved technique uses just one variable to move images horizontally. This image is at position this.x and the position of the second image is calculated from that by adding this.x plus this.width. The second image is always 2400 pixels to the right of the first image. This way, they will always be synchronized since the position of both images is coming from the same variable. As you can see, the movement is different now. We never actually fully see the second image anymore. We just see this small part that pops in place so that it looks like it's one long seamless image. Again, the transition, the reset where the images move to the right to start from their original position happens very fast. It happens instantly, so we jump from this to this. And that makes it look like it's just one seamless movement. We can also calculate position x differently. I can create game frame variable and I set it to zero. Then in my animation loop here on line 65, I increase game frame by one for every animation frame. This way we have a number that is endlessly increasing. Now I can replace this if statement on line 40 with a different calculation. When I remove this if statement completely, the backgrounds no longer reset when they leave the screen. I also comment out line 43 and I can replace all of this with just one line of code. I say this.x from line 30 is equal to game frame variable we just created and I use remainder operator and this.width from line 32. 
This dot width is currently 2400 pixels and game frame is endlessly increased in number. This calculation will make sure this dot x cycles endlessly between 0 and the value of this dot width between 0 and 2400 pixels, which will have the same effect as we had before. Oh, it will go to the right. I need to do game frame minus minus on line 66. That's better. But now all our layers are moving at the same speed. I need to factor in this dot speed from line 36 in this calculation on line 44. This dot x equals to game frame times this dot speed modulus this dot width. Now we have the same parallax effect. This one line of JavaScript replaced all the code between lines 40 and 43. I don't think it's very clear and easy to see what's happening on line 44 just by looking at it. I really have to use my brain and remind myself how modulus operator works to understand why it's cycling between zero and this dot width. I did a complete breakdown of this technique in my sprite animation video. I will link it in the video description. I'm not gonna explain this calculation all over again. <laughs> I don't think we need to understand this line because it has one disadvantage when compared to the code I had previously on lines 40 to 43. Look, when I change scrolling speed, the position of background jumps somewhere else because we aren't gradually increasing this dot x like we did before. We are recalculating that value completely every time game speed changes. Clicking this input slider changes game speed global variable. Changing game speed affects this dot speed because of line 39 and this dot speed changes value of this dot x on line 44. If you know how to use this technique to make it seamless without jumps in horizontal position when I change game speed, let me know, please. I'm sure there is some smart way to do it. I played with it for a while and I couldn't work it out. <laughs> do you see how the background jumps every time I change game speed? Let's comment out these lines so that we can compare it. When using the original technique, horizontal position transitions smoothly without jumps and that is exactly what I want. I need to be able to change my scrolling speed dynamically because I want the scroll speed of my game to change when a character performs special moves like roll or sit. Let's comment out line 66 since we decided not to use this technique and I also comment out line 6. Our images are large. It works well because I'm running my code locally. If this code base was hosted somewhere online, we need to make sure all images and HTML elements on my page are fully loaded before we start the game. On line 19, I take browser window object and I call add event listener on it. I listen for load event. In callback function, when the page is fully loaded, only then I will run all this code. That depends on images, canvas and slider element to be properly loaded and available. Do you have any ideas how to improve this code base? Did you manage to code along with me today all the way here? How was the speed of my explanations? Too fast? Too slow? Let me know, I'm always looking for your feedback. Parallax effect is a great way to give depth and illusion of 3D to your 2D games. It can also be used for creative websites for example. Check out the link in the video description if you want to learn more about parallax effect with JavaScript. Today's challenge will be about event listeners and keyboard input. Can you adjust controls on slider so that the game speeds up and slows down when the player presses plus or minus keys on keyboard? Little tip for beginners, you can do it with key up or key down event listeners. I hope you got a lot of value today. Thank you so much for staying and coding with me. If you're still feeling creative, check out some of my playlists. And don't forget to like this video if you want to let me know you want more content like this in the future. 